Welcome back to my workshop. Today we're going to be building portable studio walls to use for a video cast that we're going to be shooting. To do this, I want to create four four by eight panels, one with a brick, which you can see the faux brick masonite in the back here, and one with the barn wood here. So there'll be barn wood on one side and brick on the other, and then we can either mix and match or I'll have all one or the other. To do this, I went out and purchased some one by threes. This is just a representative sample. Hey, just a quick tip for other shade tree carpenters out there. When I say I bought a one inch by three inch by eight foot board length from my local store, what I actually purchased was a two and a half width, three quarter inch width, eight foot plus a little. Now, the, one of the reasons that they do that in running board lengths is the blade size that I use to cut my board is going to vary. And that's gonna take some of the board length out of the running length of the board. So when I go to measure and cut out of an eight foot board, two four foot pieces, I'll want to take a factory edge, meaning the edge that I purchased it with, measure from there, mark my four foot and then cut it. Then go mark another four foot and cut it again. This is the result of that measurement. So this is how much out of the eight foot board length minus my blade widths that I have left in the eight foot to get two four foot sections. I know that sounds a little confusing, but they do that on purpose so that you don't buy an eight foot board and try and cut two four foot pieces and then you're not able to go square because your blade width took a little bit of that wood away. So this is your wiggle room. Now another way you could do that is to build a template and set it out on your saw so that every time you lay your board in, it's also called a jig, every time you lay your board on, every board is cut exactly the same length. I didn't take the time to do that today, so I wanted to remind you or tell you that your board measurements aren't always going to be as they're billed on the label in the store. So make sure you check that out and get the right board length. Well, we've got some one by threes back here by eights. Those are eight by four foot masonite panels. I have to cut these verticals down to ensure that they fit the eight foot length or height of those masonite pieces. So if I'm building this construction and I put my vertical joint against my horizontal like this, when that wall is lifted or torqued to be moved or slid around, it's gonna put a lot of unnecessary force on this joint. Instead, I want my horizontal, my four foot horizontal one by three to go all the way across the bottom and set my verticals right on top of it. Now when that's lifted and drug around, it's not going to be ripping apart a joint. However, if I do that, if I put an eight foot one by three on top of a four foot, I'm going to have an additional distance here. Okay, say this is my top and this is my bottom. I lay those together, I get an inch and a half differential that I have to account for out of my eight foot verticals. So the first thing I'm going to do is cut my inch and a half off of my eight foot one by threes to ensure that from top to bottom, it's no higher than my eight foot wall. So that'll be the first thing I'll be doing this morning and then we'll come back with some more details as we get those measured out. All of my one by three by eights now cut down an inch and a half to compensate for the horizontal tops and bottoms to give me a total of eight foot from the top and the bottom. My next step for my vertical boards is to put some finger holes or some hand holds into the side. When one person is trying to move an eight foot by four foot panel, even though it's fairly thin, it's still pretty heavy. That masonite by itself weighs a good, good bit. So I wanna be able to put some finger slots into these boards in the middle of them to allow one person to be able to grab and get a good grip on them and lift and move those walls if need be. Now, hopefully we'll always have more than one person moving these walls, but just in case, having some handholds in the walls makes it much easier for moving them. So the next thing I'm gonna do is route a three quarter inch slit that's about four inches long in each of the center of these boards. All right, I have my finger hole templates here on my one by threes. My next step is going to be to route those out and then sand the edges so they're nice and smooth. All right, so this next part where I'm gonna route the handles out, I'm going to be using a what's called a plunge router or drop router, and it has a plate that allows me to 
push down into my material only as deep as I want to go. And then when I'm done, it pulls it back up and puts it back into a place of safety, the bit back into safety. We're going to be using a three quarter inch bit here that you can see. Let's see if I can get it a little closer. And I've attached to it just a piece of scrap wood to give me a guide to go along so that I can make a straight line with my router. Now, most routers will tell you which direction they route or the bits will tell you. So you can see on the front of this router that there's a little arrow here. So that means I'll be routing this direction only. So I want to get a nice clean line and that's why I added my little block to my router base to give me a guide to go along that edge of the board. So that's next, we're gonna do a three quarter inch route so that's big enough to get fingers into to get a hold of it. All right, here's our one by three with its routed grip hole there. This is going to allow us to get our fingers in and move those walls without hurting the wall or ourselves, hopefully. I need to do this to the rest of the vertical one by threes for our walls. And from there, we'll start looking at how we're going to assemble the frames. All right, next, we're gonna take our one by three by eights and cut them down into one by three by fours. This will give our horizontal base and top to our eight foot panel wall. All right, our next step is going to be to connect our vertical wall board with the horizontal base. I need this to be 90 degrees if I want this to work. Because I'm working by myself today, I'm actually going to use a corner clamp. So I'll be able to use that clamp here and make sure it holds it good and tight while I pre-drill this wood. One of the reasons I want to pre-drill this wood is because it is only three quarter inch and I'm going to be putting this screw into the wood, I don't want it to split or to crack. So I want to make sure that I pre-drill this wood so that it leaves room for the screw to get a really good grip but also not split the wood. Now I'm also going to bevel my entry point. So if you could look at this at the screw here, you can see that it has a bevel. Well, I want this to sink in. So it's called countersinking. So instead of screwing it in and having it, let me do it here. Instead of screwing in and having it stop here when it hits the wood, I want to countersink it so it'll set flat into the wood. The bit that you use to do that looks like this. So it has the drill section here, which pre-drills the wood, and it also has a section which automatically cuts a bevel so it countersinks my screw. I'll be then using the star bit here, and that star bit fits the head of the types of screws that I'm using, which are star bit screws, okay? Sorry, it's a little blurry there. iPhones have a tough time with focus. So that's our next step, is to connect our verticals with our horizontals, and those are the tools that we're gonna use. Right, this is how that corner clamp works. So it holds my corner joint very tight here so that I can add my pre-drilled holes with the countersinks. So I wanna make sure this edge is even, and I'm going to be drilling here and going right into the edge of that vertical one by three. There we go. Okay, that gives us two beveled pre-drill holes. Let's go ahead and put our screws in. All right, that's why we want to pre-drill with the bevel, because now it's nice and flat. It allows us to have a nice tight fit for the screws to go in without catching on anything. It also doesn't crack this edge and it goes straight into our vertical upright. All right, we have our frame built. As you can see each of the corners, the screws are countersunk so they don't stick out and they're at 90 degrees. Next, we need to create the center pieces which will go from this inside edge to that inside edge. There'll be three coming across to give us support for the masonite as it lays on top of the board. We do have to keep in mind that our bottom and our top is at four foot from this edge to that far edge, which means our boards that go to the inside edges have to be four foot minus the three quarter inch on both sides. So that gives us an inch and a half that we need to remove from the four foot, cost, from the four foot cross struts that are gonna go across there. 
That's what we'll be cutting next. All right, behind me I have laid out all of our horizontal slats that are gonna go inside this wall. You'll notice also that I have the blue uh, 90 degree angle clamp on the side here. This is just to make sure that I get my 90 degree angle and it's a tight joint when I pre-drill and countersink the holes on each side. So that's what we're gonna do next and connect all our horizontal slats into this wall. All right, as you can see, we have uh, our entire frame built now. We have all the outside edges and three slats in the middle to strengthen that wall. The next bit is a little more interesting. When we're building this type of a wall, and this is obviously small pieces, but for the sample, we have a vertical upright wall attached to our lower end wall here, all right? One of the things that we have to think about is when this wall is standing, and all the weight is shifting, what's gonna keep the wall upright? You know, a, a two and a half inch surface is not enough to keep an eight inch wall from tipping. So what we do is we add another four foot section underneath our bottom base piece. We're going to then drill a bolt like this up and through and into the frame and this will allow us to have an axis to pivot this section of the wall out. So the floor will be cut, it's four foot wide, and we'll cut it in half, so it'll be two foot on each side. But essentially what it'll give us is then a, an ability to pivot an arm out either direction, depending upon which wall is facing forward to the camera. And that becomes a foot that gives us the footprint we need to keep the wall from falling over. To do this, if I were just to use the, the white pine and drill a single hole through the white pine and add our bolt, it's not very strong. White pine's fairly soft, it's easy to work with. But I wanna keep that strong. So what I'm going to do is I have some pieces of oak, one by three pieces of oak, and say, these, uh, I'll do the scale a little differently. Say these are the white and this is the white pine and this is actually the oak. I'm gonna take a smaller piece of oak and embed it right inside my one by three wall in the corner. Now I can drill through and have the strength of the oak in this top piece, which gives me a great joint to pivot on for the outside leg. And it gives me a stronger, harder wood so that nothing breaks through. Okay, here's our eight foot by four foot wall. And we're working on the support leg that we're gonna attach. The vertical side, which we put the um, hand holds in, you can see that right up there, okay? And now I'm going to bolt in this leg that can fold out and give us a support. So we'll be able to put sandbags on this and support the wall. I reinforce the strength here for the bolt to go into with red oak. That's what this piece is here. You can see I've got screws going in this way. I also have screws here. And then I put some screws in this end just for good measure to reinforce that corner joint. Next, I'm going to put this locking nut. You, it's hard to see, but there's a little bit of a, a plastic or a resin inside of this so that when this nut goes on, it doesn't, it won't allow it to unscrew itself and loosen up. And there's the washer that I put on to keep it from compressing into the wood. Now, I will tighten this down and make this a snug fit so it'll be tight to pull in and out. However, it will not be so tight that I can't easily manipulate this leg and spin it either way. Now, I also went and I cut these so that they'd be flush on these edges so that no matter which side of the wall is facing the video camera, I can have the support leg going behind it with a sandbag and not have any tripping hazards on the video side of the set. So I'm gonna be making these uh, pieces for all of the walls. I'm gonna go ahead and pre-cut these now and get them drilled and ready to go. Okay, our support leg joint is done and it's fairly stiff, but there it is. So that will come out and allow us to put sandbags to support the eight foot height. Now, 
obviously it makes me a little nervous. This is just three quarter inch white pine, which is pretty soft. But if we put our sandbags on here and we're diligent with connecting our walls, then we shouldn't have any problems for, from a support standpoint. So this is the fold out leg, which will go underneath the wall and allow us to stabilize that eight foot height. Now, of course, we're gonna have the other eight foot panels next to it. So we'll have other ways to stabilize this wall. That's just to give us a starter uh, to keep this wall standing upright and keep it from falling on our talent. All right, I just wanted to give you a view of the final eight foot frame. So that is our frame up. And I've just got some weights on there to keep it from falling over. But that's the idea. And now what we'll do is we'll skin one side of this with brick and we'll skin the other side with the wood panel. All right, the evening is here and we have gotten all the frames built. Now we're going to be skinning the frames with the masonite. So on this side, we're gonna put barn wood. On the other side, we're gonna put the brick pattern. The first thing I'll do is run liquid nails on the top side edge that the masonite's gonna set against. Once that's covered, we'll set the masonite on top and I'll use a nail gun and nail down all my edges. Notice I did not put any glue on the leg here. So this is the leg that's gonna slide out and be our wall support. So we don't wanna glue that down. And our wall board's gonna stop here. So this is gonna be the bottom without the wall board on top of it. So this can slide out either direction. But So make sure you don't put liquid nails on these legs. Okay, we have our first side on with our glue and we flipped it over. Now we're gonna lay the brick pattern on and complete this wall. Indiana Wesleyan University's Studio 220. We're actually on the Digital to Learn, as you can see the sign laid out here, uh, podcast studio set where we're going to use our portable walls. This silver label is actually going to be mounted behind me on the brick wall. So when we're doing our podcast, this is kind of how we're going to have it laid out. We're still working out some of the lighting and the layout, but it's a good preview. So let's take a look at how these walls fit into the bigger scheme of the room. And here we go. This is the actual set design. We have a background light. We have some other lights spaced around that you can kind of see in the camera now at this angle. However, what I wanted you to take note of is how the panels are laid out. I have our wood facing out on the sides at a little bit of an angle to the back to add again some more stability. Uh, it's not quite done yet, but we're going to add some support bands at the top which connect these walls. Again, just giving more stability to the whole system. The kickback legs that we built for the sandbags are all flipped back behind the wall, so there's nothing here for me to trip on as I move through the set, which is very important. One thing that I didn't realize until we started assembling here in the set, and it's a good thing to know as you do your own studio walls, if you have horizontal lines like wood slats or brick borders, make sure that you lay your panels out so that they match before you glue and staple the panels down to the frame. As you can see, I'm off by about a quarter of an inch on our brick pattern walls, which means I'm going to have to raise this panel a quarter inch to get these to match before I can really sandwich them together. So that's gonna be a little bit of a challenge because I have to do it after the fact. I'm gonna have to create some shims to lift this wall up just a touch. That's a bummer, but sometimes that happens. Hopefully you'll take some notes, watch this tutorial, build your own studio walls and have success. So watch your horizontal lines, uh, consider your vertical lines too, depending upon what your background looks like. Have a great week and thanks for tuning in and watching how to build portable set walls for your studio.